Hello, everybody. Um, good morning. It's a pleasure for me uh, to be here. Thank you very much for um, taking uh, the time and giving me the opportunity to talk to you um, a little bit. Um, yes, we are obviously going through, um, some people are saying it's an evolution, some people are saying it's a revolution. I actually personally think it's a revolution on the consumer side, on the technology side, um, driven by what is happening in the online world that I personally think is uh, completely unheard of. A lot of you probably uh, see this or experience this. Uh, also personally, um, I recently moved to um, London and uh, I moved into a, a new house here and um, it didn't have a broadband uh, connection yet. So the first thing I did is I actually, um, and I'm not sure how you actually moved into houses 10 years ago, but the first thing I did, I moved into the house, I walked over to my neighbor and I said to my neighbor, uh, can I please have your WEP key uh, to log into your wireless network for a few uh, weeks until I have my uh, broadband connection? So I, th that I thought that was kind of interesting, but well, several interesting things about it. The first thing, um, you might say, well, at least a Google um, executive who's asking for a wireless LAN password um, before logging in. And I uh, obviously apologize for any mistakes we've made in the past uh, in this area. Um, but the real, the real interesting part um, about this was that he actually looked at me. And remember, the WEP key is like, what, a 16-digit key or something? He looked at me, and he gave it to me top of his mind. Like right away, he said the key to me. And obviously, he couldn't digest it and couldn't memorize 16 digits. So I have to say, could you please give me a piece of paper so I can write it down? He said he has so many kids and so many different devices logging in all the time that he actually knows the pretty complex key by heart now to use. So you're seeing there is really something. I'm sure all of you have those kind of stories in your personal and your private lives just to show you how the world uh, is changing on the consumer side. And with such a revolution happening on the consumer side, obviously there are also huge changes in the whole world uh, of online advertising. And this is the subject that I was asked to, to talk about a bit today. And as you can see, and as you already know, um, we're talking about a market which is uh, roughly, there are different analyst estimates out there, but let's say the consensus is somewhere around 60 to 65 billion uh, global market uh, from um, the latest estimates, from a market that nearly didn't exist probably uh, X years ago, however you want to define um, the X. If you, if you if you take a look at the, um, at the current projections and where this market is heading, it is also, it is, it is going to be obviously uh, very significant. If you look at the latest Zenith numbers, for example, that just came out, they're saying it's going to be somewhere around a 90 billion uh, market by 2013. Um, if, I'm not sure, but many of you have probably seen the latest Mary Meeker, um, now ex, uh, ex Morgan Stanley uh, presentation, who's just uh, took a very, the very traditional look at the delta between the famous 28% time spent online and the, and, um, and the corresponding ad spend figure globally, 13, 14%. And then she estimated that there's probably an extra 50 billion um, um, if that gap were to be closed. Uh, but to be honest, we've talked about this gap in between um, time spent online and uh, media consumed online and, and how much um, of the advertising money and ad spend is actually going there. For, for, I don't know, 10, 15 years or since I've been in the industry. So the really interesting question or the really interesting thing to look at uh, from my perspective is what is changing now? What is happening in this world that we will see over the next years a dramatic acceleration and a complete revolution also in the world of online advertising? And there are a lot of different things coming together. Um, but what I'd like to do is I'd like to talk to you uh, about three or four of them that I personally feel um, are extremely relevant and are really making a difference from what we've seen um, in the past. The first one has to do with really um, the way online targeting works and um, the new signals that we will see emerging in the world of online targeting. And this is actually quite interesting if you think about it. Look at, and, and to understand it, you need to basically take a look at how consumers have or have navigated the digital world and how they're going to navigate the digital world going forward. So very, very simple. If you take a look at how you used to navigate digital information 10 years ago, it was a very browsing-centric type of navigation, right? And then you had all this information coming up and you know all about those exabytes, information, and so on and so on. And so the consumer finally decided that the easiest way to ever actually navigate the digital world is by searching because of all that information. And by the way, it's real interesting because it's not something that um, that Google actually invented. There were a lot of search engines out there. Google had kind of an okay product, so we, we generated an acceptable market share. But um, uh, the reality is it was a very fundamental consumer need that you wanted to navigate masses of information in a very search-centric way. Well, the interesting part about this one is 
that we see with new devices and for new formats, search-centric navigation actually extending to those. So very simple, what do I mean with this? Take a look at audio-visual information. We currently have somewhere around 4 billion searches a day globally, overall, not only Google, but overall. And we see on a product like YouTube, roughly around half a billion searches a day. Half a billion searches a day on YouTube. So people are suddenly searching audio-visual information. Um, take a look at the number one of how people access the mobile world. We know from a lot of research that the number one way of accessing the web via the mobile world um, is actually search-centric. They are searching to go onto the web. If you take pro look at products like Google TV and so on, I can already make you the prediction um, that in a few years down the road, the number one way of how you will navigate your television set will be in a, in a search-centric way. You obviously need to combine this with voice recognition and a couple of other new technologies, but it becomes pretty obvious of how this is going to work out. The second big pillar of digital navigation going, to f to going forward um, will be recommendation-centric navigation. So it's based on some sort of recommendation. And here it becomes really interesting because then you need to ask yourself, what type of signals are actually feeding into my recommendation? And there are a lot of different signals. It could be social signals uh, that are feeding the recommendation. It could be location-based signals, and we're talking about the four squares of this world. Um, it could be a purchase type of um, signals, which you've seen for a long time. If you take a look at what you see on Amazon type of recommendations, um, it could be taste type, of re taste type of signals. That's what you see when you look at uh, products like Boutiques or Hunch, for example. It could be a really powerful, very s simple signal that you might be using as an advertiser, as a company, which is, has somebody visited my website? And the question is, how do you, can, can you work with retargeting and similar type of approaches? So the type of signals that you will be able to generate in the future are going to be hugely important in how you look at targeting and how you look at success for your business. And my personal opinion is there will be a whole new set. You will find ways of taking advantage of them. But keep in mind, there was, will always be the so far extremely success, successful signal um, of search. Because remember, from a business perspective, um, the search signal is a very beautiful one. It's a very beautiful one because it tells you exactly um, what the consumer thinks about, usually in an anonymous way. So it's a very powerful signal that can be used in a lot of devices uh, in the future. So in a way, we're in a very lucky uh, position when it comes to this. And also, what you will see is that marketers in the future will have increasingly the opportunity to take advantage with all of your, their new tools of those new signals, whether it is um, real-time bids, real-time placement, look at products like Invite, look at products like ad exchanges, real-time selections of uh, creatives. You've seen what, what is happening in the world of Terrace and, and so on. So you will see a radical uh, revolution in this, um, in this area. However, this is not going to be not going to make a difference if not another big trend is basically playing along with this. And the other big trend has to do with really the, the richness of today's web and how it can lead to completely new creative possibilities. And what do I mean with this? Just look at how the web, again, looked like a few years ago and what you can do now, and especially take a look at the world of video, the emotional, engaging experience that can be, ate, be created now with everything that you see in the world of video. We currently have somewhere around 2 billion videos, 2 billion videos being streamed on YouTube every single day. That's a very, very big number, right? And there are a lot of different forecasts, but let's take a, one at a company that should really know this. This latest Cisco forecast is saying that in the year 2014, over 90% of web traffic is going to be video-based traffic, right? Um, so this will have a fundamental impact on how consumers look at advertising. It will have a fundamental impact of how traditional players are moving onto the web because there's one thing that everybody understands. There's one thing that every FMCG player understands. Um, Video can build creative, exp can build emotional experiences, can build engaging experiences. And now if you combine video with the, com the better targeting, if you combine it with better personalization, if you combine it with everything around the world of social, you will see things like the famous Tipex campaign. I'm pretty sure everybody here in the room has seen it. You're, I'm sure you're all aware of the Old Spice campaign. I didn't bring the videos along. You can all look them up. Um, on YouTube, but you can see how the world of advertising will be revolutionized, but what you can do with a combination of video, of social, of personalization. And actually, this is not such a new trend, and actually really didn't originate in the traditional world of advertising. 
Uh, just let me do a quick check here, but who in the room has seen um, the Obama um, personalized video campaign that was leading up to the Obama campaign about two years ago? Because that was one of the best first examples of how this type of video interaction technology, personalization, and social usage can actually be applied. It's actually pretty old, it's like two years old. Who here has seen it? Can you just ask a question? So like. 20% of the people. So I'm going to show you quickly um, the video for the ones who haven't seen it, just to give you a feeling. Um, it is an old one, but it's still a classic um, one. It's close, but the nation was shocked Tuesday night to see John McCain defeat Barack Obama by a single vote. We sure showed him what a comeback looks like. For many, shock soon turned to outrage as the New York Times revealed the identity of the particular non-voter responsible for Obama's loss. In just a few short days, this private citizen has become a national pariah. Fearing retribution, local police took the non-voter into protective custody yesterday at City Hall. Disgruntled citizens have been demonstrating ever since. You're supposed to Barack the vote. Well, what happened? Nobody, the vote didn't even get Barack. I waited in line five hours to vote with an arthritic hip, and this mother <laughs> lazy couldn't get out of bed in time to vote. International reaction has been just as intense, even in some of the most remote locations. Yo, Miruan Obama, yo, yo, However, the non-voter has become a hero to a small sliver of the population. I thank you for your service. I thank you for what you've done for the United States of America. Bet that guy is a factor viewer. He's also a patriot. Coming up, how long until we nuke Iran? Experts say it could be as early as Saturday, around lunchtime. How long did it take to create this video? Not the first version, but the personalized version for me. How long did it take? One second. One second two years ago. Very cheap technology available everywhere. We know from a lot of research all over the place that if you want to boost conversion rates, if you're an online, uh, in an online business, if you offer products, integrate video into your site, make it a richer experience. We know that richer emotional experience sell better. We know this stuff works. This is an old example. There's much better, much newer stuff out there, as I mentioned before. Look at Tipex, look at uh, the Old Spy stuff, look at uh, some of the other things out there. This is revolutionizing the world of online advertising um, uh, like you have not uh, seen uh, before. The, th the third um, big trend um, in this area has to do with the whole world of mobile. And this is so old that I'm kind of scared to stand in front of a crowd like you and even mention it because we've talked about it for such a long time. So we need to really take a look at what is different now to all of the last 15 to 20 years that we've always talked about, yeah, at one point in time, this mobile thing is going to take off. And I think the big difference now is that actually three components are coming together. And this is all well known. It's the component of what has happened on the handset side. It's the connectivity element. And it's actually the cloud element. The handset component was actually pretty predictable. And if you look at the techno technology adoption curves, um, it was kind of expected that handsets at one point in time would be able to do what they're currently doing. There is a bit of a surprise, I personally think, in terms of sensor technology, what those handsets are not able to do when it comes to all the micro sensors, whether it's the microphones, whether it's the accelerometers in there and so on. So I think the micro sensor technology has made it kind of an unexpected quantum leap. Um, the connectivity part is still the part that is actually the one that breaks down the most often or the most frequently when you actually want to use that technology. So in order to understand where this is heading and why we can only give everybody the advice, don't bet against mobile, is because with LTE coming up over the next few years, you will see a revolution in connectivity and your mobile experience and this whole richness of experience will transfer from the web to the mobile phone in a much, much better way than today. But the real interesting part is actually coming from the cloud side. Look at it as the supercomputer is doing a lot more. And look at the technology curve, what is happening on the cloud side versus on the other advices, on the, on the normal, um, on the devices, which I think is much more unpredictable and can potentially go much faster than in the other areas. And a lot of the products that are completely 
wow products that are revolutionizing the world of mobile and look at some of the uh, visual recognition things like we have a product called Google Goggles, which you're all aware of, or look at some of the revolutions that are happening on the translation side are literally only possible because of the speed of development on the supercomputer on the cloud side and not so much on the expected development on the, uh, on the traditional uh, mobile phone. So it's really important to understand how this triangle develops and how the individual elements of the triangles develop and to see what type of um, um, revolution can kick in at what point in time. Um, and my big um, suggestion would be don't bet against it um, because you can already see that the, the, what is happening with the mobile phone is becoming a very big bridge between the online and the offline world. And it becomes obvious if you think about the world of couponing, obviously, uh, it becomes very obvious if you think about what some of the large retailers in the US are starting to do, look at what Best Buy is now doing, they're basically saying, okay, I have all this footfall in my store, I have all the people running into my store, I don't know who they are, maybe I can give them an app, maybe I can give them the right location-based services, and I actually can actually learn information about them and get to know my customers and make them special offers in a way that I've never been able uh, to do um, before. You all know what this can obviously do once you think about NFC type of chips in the next generation of sets, right, where we basically build transactional near field transactional capability into the mobile phones, which will also look at it from an online advertising perspective um, and can make a significant difference there. Um, and just think about what you can do, obviously, in terms of creative experiences, richer creative experiences with location. Once you have the location signal with the mobile phone, uh, look at, for example, some of the stuff that Mini has done in Sweden. Really interesting. Go to YouTube, Google for um, uh, Mini in Stockholm. You will see some really, really rich creative experience with the mobile phone um, that will revolutionize the way we interact with the phone and how we look at uh, online advertising in this world. Um, the last trend is probably a bit boring, but it's really important for the world of advertising and online advertising to really change because the world will only change if the large, the very, very large uh, traditional players, the large FMCG players actually moving into the market. Um, and this has really to do with the whole world of ad effectiveness research. And I know whenever I mention the word research, it's like dead boring and people are saying, oh my God, what is he talking about and why should we even be listening to this? But what has happened in the world of ad effectiveness and online ad effectiveness research, what has, uh, what has happened in that world over the last few years, we now have in several markets um, huge panels, huge panels of thousands and thousands of consumers where we can actually prove and show you that things that are happening in the online advertising world are actually having an impact on traditional sales in the offline world, right? I mean, we always knew, yes, there's online advertising and it can sell online, but the biggest thing that has held back traditional players in moving into this world and revolutionizing the space is can it actually do something for me offline? Does it have an impact? Can it sell my Coke cans? Can it do something in my store? And the research that has happened in this, uh, in this area over the last probably two years has been so extreme and so clear. I mean, if you take an average of all the research that we've done in the retail sector, you can actually see that for every dollar online spend, there's roughly $12 of offline spend being generated. I mean, this is huge, this is huge. And I talked to probably all of the CEOs and CMOs of all the large traditional FMCG players at this moment, um, and I can tell you, they understand that. They understand that in a world where I can prove that online sales, I have a rich consumer experience from video and have completely new ways of doing targeting online, um, I have a medium that is here to stay, and I will ha they have a medium where they will si shift significant amounts of money into, um, into this new world. So this was just a little overview of some of the big trends we see in the world of online advertising. If you don't believe everything I said, if you think there are consumers out there who are not gonna go along this path, you might be right. My favorite story, I'm sure if you heard it about, but it's actually my favorite all-time Google customer experience story, is um, an old lady, 75 years old, um, and um, she actually walked into, I think it was our Hamburg office, and she came to the reception, and uh, she said at the reception, uh, where can I buy my magnetic resonance therapy kind of stuff? And um, the, we actually had a guy sitting at the reception, and the guy at the reception said, um, said to her, well, you're at Google, you can get this here. And she said, yes, 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 I can. I talked to my doctor and he said, he doesn't have it and I should go to Google. That's why I would get it. So maybe, <laughs> maybe there are some consumers out there um, who are not making that transition. Um, all the other ones, I think. Will, thank you very much um, for listening to me and I'm happy to take a couple of questions now if you want to. Thank you.